time Rajiv Gandhi came to office, Rajiv Gandhi genuinely wanted to resolve this problem in Sri Lanka. So he worked with President Jayawardena. They had the Indo Lanka agreement. And of course, eventually the Tamil Tigers realized that India was going to prevent their avowed goal of a separate state. So what did the Tamil Tigers do? They fought the Indian peacekeeping force. 1,555 Indian soldiers were killed. 3,000 Indian soldiers were injured. General Mehta, who is here, the Indian peacekeeping force commander, I want to say that India made a huge sacrifice for the peace, security, and stability of Sri Lanka. And I also want to say that in many ways, Indian leaders realized after the Rajiv Gandhi killing that the ambitions of Prabhakaran was much beyond creating an independent Tamil state. Prabhakaran lobbied not only Sri Lankan Tamils but also Indian Tamils. Even to this date, the principal operating base for the Tamil Tigers after the dismantling of the LTT in Sri Lanka is in India. There are more than 120 Tamil Tigers who are operating in Tamil Nadu and very key extremist Tamil political leaders like Vaiko, these leaders are quite actively providing assistance to the Tamil Tigers. Tomorrow there is a meeting in the European Union in Brussels and one of those key Tamil political leaders are traveling from India to address that event. So I want to say that after the Gandhi assassination, the central government of India had a different attitude towards Tamil Tigers. So India assisted Sri Lanka very significantly in the fight. And the president of Sri Lanka realized that working with India was crucial. So India was kept fully informed. This was a very delicate relationship. It was a very delicate relationship because India did not want to provide arms, ammunition and explosives. But India did provide other forms of assistance, primarily intelligence. Of course, India continued to provide training for Sri Lankan military officers. And it was a very delicate relationship because Sri Lanka had to depend on two enemies of India to provide arms, ammunition, explosives for the Sri Lankan military. I'm using the term enemies within inverted commas. I will say adversaries. One is China and the other is Pakistan. At one point, when the Sri Lankan military was struggling, when the Sri Lankan troops were surrounded in Jaffna, the LTT was planning to encircle them, the Sri Lankan military requested assistance from Pakistan. General Musharraf was in office. General Musharraf, he responded decisively. He said, we will send you the MBRLs. But during that time, India was under very significant pressure. India said, we will send you the ships to move your troops to the south. These are hard realities, but hard truths. Very painful ones. But I also want to share with you that managing that relationship with India today and in the future is crucial. Because in South Asia, we have seen that those countries did not work with India. They had difficulties. They had challenges. So I believe that the relationship with China is crucial for economic prosperity of Sri Lanka. But again, the political relationship with India, India is crucial. So the president realized this and he, he managed the relationship with India very well. Because India is the only country that could have prevented the Sri Lankan military from dismantling the LTT in the final stage. And I believe that that relationship needs to be continued if Sri Lanka is going to prosper and become one of the most developed countries in the coming years. So, just to recap, the first factor was to defeat any terrorist group, any insurgent group in the world, you must disrupt the logistical line and recruitment line. The logistical line disrupted by the Sri Lanka Navy. The recruitment line, I want to say that the Tamil Tigers, there were three big mistakes they made. One was the Tamil Tigers went into a forced recruitment. 
when the Tamil Tigers was a very small group, everyone who joined the Tamil Tigers were volunteers. And they were the most dedicated cadres. But when they start to forcibly recruit, those youth, most of them did not want to fight. That is why when the war ended, after Prabhakaran was killed, or even just before he was killed, 11,500 Tamil Tigers surrendered. And those 11,500, most of them were sent through a rehabilitation process. They did not want to fight. I interviewed a very large number of them. They didn't want to fight. More than 40% of them were forcibly recruited. In fact, uh, it was a very tragic story. Many of them were studying at school. Even they were recruited and they were forced to fight. So, the second factor is that during the peace talks, some of you may be critical of the peace talks, but during the peace talks, the Tamil Tiger organization that held together during war, these organizations started to crumble from within. That happened because many Tamils, many Tamils who were sympathizers and supporters of the group, and even many LTT cadres, they started to question, why are we killing ourselves? Why are we in an organization like this? Because they tasted what is freedom. They could travel to the south. And even many leaders, they got married, they had children. They didn't want to go back to war. And there were some leaders who started to lead very luxurious lives. Some leaders even built upstairs houses. And I know of some leaders, I debriefed, and they told me, they came to Colombo to buy potted plants to buy curtains, to buy tiles for their house. They became like you. They want to have a good life. So, when the war started, they didn't want to fight. That is why in the final stage, so many leaders were holed up in that no-fire zone area because they tasted peace. And of course, one of their best military commanders Karuna, who was the eastern commander. He traveled. He went to Bangkok. And you know, Bangkok is a very beautiful place for a young man. He traveled to Europe. Again, such a beautiful place. He tasted what is freedom. In Norway, he wanted to sign the Oslo communique. You see? But there was a lot of pressure. Because Prabhakaran was never genuinely committed for peace. And when Karuna came back, Prabhakaran wanted to do the job on him. So Karuna fled. He went to the east and after that he broke away. So the LTT lost about a third of its fighting force. And with Karuna's defection, the intelligence in the east vastly improved. And the people in the east started to question Prabhakaran. Because traditionally most of the resources for the LTT came from the East. The fighting cadres, the food, the rice came from the East. The money came from the East. It was a very big blow. So the North, the one sector of the LTT could not be sustained. Because LTT had three theatres. They had the North, which the military was holding, Jaffna Peninsula the Vani area where LTT was located, and of course the east that was liberated with Karuna's uh, defection. So, if you look at the LTT structure locally, these were the developments. But internationally there were other developments. After September 11th, after America attacked, after Al-Qaeda attacked America's most iconic landmarks, the international environment changed the United States itself disrupted three Tamil Tiger procurement cells. Karunakaran, who was the head of LTT in the United States, he was arrested. Number of cells in Canada that were operating into the United States, procuring arms, they were arrested. And the United States started to share that intelligence with their European and with their Australian counterparts. Not only that, the United States 
provided a very important uh, coast guard vessel that could operate in the high seas with the Sri Lankan Navy.